put your name. King of kings, Lord of lords, we come before you this moment, Father, we commit our minds, our hearts, we commit this segment into your hands, O oh Father, speak through this clay, O oh Lord. The clay that you have sanctified and purified, oh, by the justification of your blood, O oh Father. Speak through me today, O oh Lord. I'll give your people mind, I'll give them a mind to comprehend and a heart of receptivity, O oh Father. Oh Lord, I pray this moment and I speak to the atmospheric realm this moment, every spirit in the atmospheric realm this moment, oh, from the Northern Hemisphere all the way through the Southern Hemisphere, from the Eastern Hemisphere through the Western Hemisphere this moment, any contradictory spirit, every spirit of deception, every spirit that has no part of what God is about to do, clear the air with this moment, Moment, oh Lord, with your purity and your righteousness. Oh Father, give me clarity of speech, oh Lord. Speak to every situation today, Father, as we study your word in the book of Revelation. Oh Father, as we go through the pages of your word today, as we look at ourselves in the world of your mirror, oh Lord, oh, bring chastisement where they need be. Oh, bring encouragement and comfort when the need arises. Father, may you alone be magnified and may you alone be seen through this message in Jesus Muchless name. I pray this hour with thanksgiving. Somebody say amen and amen. We want to thank God one more time for his word. God is sovereign. Last week, as you already know, we uh we've started a book of Revelation, and we've been uh, discovering. A lot of good things in the word of God. We have been discovering a lot of marvelous stuff in the word of God. Just to read. I can't hear you. Oh, you can't hear me? Hello. You can't hear me? Can you hear me now? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Can everybody hear me? Uh, wave at me if you can hear me. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yes, I uh, do. Amen. Um, yeah, to make it human, you can, you can uh, whatever you want to say, Sam, we are recording, but we are human. So if you want to just don't speak over me, but if you want to say something, you are free too, but don't speak over me. I don't speak over anybody because we are recording. Amen. But amen. feel free. Amen. Um, so last week, we talked about, as more of us, we were still in the vision. We were in uh, vision number two. And uh, we talked about the vision of God in heaven now uh, on the throne. We are probably going to go into the seven seals, opening of the seven seals. So we went a little bit into uh, Revelation chapter four. We had looked at, I believe, uh, the number of words, the word thrones found in the Bible. Uh, we uh, talked a little bit about that. Today, I believe we're going to go into the, um, the 24 elders that the Bible mentioned. And if possible, if when time permits, we're going to look at the living beings around the throne, around the throne. Um, if my memory set me right, as we uh, uh, talked about uh, this book of Revelation, I believe I had already mentioned about how John sees God in heaven uh, sitting on his throne, uh, which signifies uh, the complete and control of time and history. 
God on his throne uh, signifies that, which is an encouragement to all of us knowing very well that daddy is so on the throne. And therefore, everything is under control. <laughs> nothing, nothing to worry about. Once you have that solidified, once you have that sealed in your conscience, you don't go ballistic. You don't go, oh, no, God never sat on, sat on Easter and said, oh, there we go again. Henry did it again. No, he never had surprises. No, <laughs> and then. He never said, so, oh, I didn't thought about that. No. So we know that God is in control. That's, the, that's what that signifies. We talk about that. And then we, I believe I also mentioned uh, that the place where the, uh, the book begins, the things that are coming, these are things, these are things means the passing of time from the things that have been to the things that will be. Um, I will encourage um, uh, Sister Millicent, I, we have all this on YouTube, the beginning of the book of Revelation, very uh, informative, uh, uh, I would say, theological based to that guide to you when you are listening to others. I, I did a teaching on, um, I'll say, method of interpretation when it comes to the book of Revelation. So because when it comes to the book of Revelation, everybody teaches it and want to blend in. So I did a breakdown on that. So when you're listening to somebody, say, hmm, what kind of method is he using? Amen. So I did method of interpretation. Now when you listen to somebody, you don't get confused. Because a lot of folks teach, we, we blend, blend everything together. But what method is a person using before saying what he or she is saying matters a lot when it comes to the uh, book of Revelation. So you may want to go back there and, and, and watch it on YouTube. We have it, I have it posted on YouTube from the beginning to this very time. Um, so I mentioned that. Then I also mentioned when John says, I saw and uses other derivatives of the verb to see it does not necessary or always mean that things he is about to see are arranged chronologically, meaning it is not in a sequence that, okay, this happened here, that happened there. It's just that what he sees, that is what he's talking about. And then that uh, is after the thing which he has just seen. It is not in chronological order by say, or, uh, per se. Now, the verb, I also mentioned the verbs to see and is derivative are often used by John as what a technique for introducing uh, subdivision under one of his visions. For instance, you see, so uh, vision one, uh, God sit on the throne, then he saw something else, that elder. So he just used those verbs to describe, as a technique, to describe subdivision of what is about uh, to transpire. Then I also talk about uh, John is evidently on app when he received the messages from the churches. Now, now he is commanded to enter heaven to receive his vision. These are all coming from Revelation chapter four, coming from Revelation chapter four. He sees a door open into heaven. He hears a voice like a trumpet calling him to enter and receive an invitation to see the things that will occur in the future. Then immediately he sees a throne, one sitting on it. I mentioned that already, got seats on this throne. Now I also mentioned last time that I'm just recapping, do we have it on recorded, but we have a, a, a new comma amount as so. Before I go to the next phase, I think it is just useful to bring that out. The word throne, I mentioned that it is found 45 times uh, in the Revelation, the book of Revelation alone, which is very interesting because that is knowing that 
you, we talk about the fact that when John sees God uh, sitting on his throne, which signifies God being in control of everything. So the number of times a throne is used in the book of Revelation alone is 45 times, which is very significant. And then only 15 times uh, the, the word throne was used in the entire New Testament. Now, Revelation, I said earlier uh, last week that based on that, Revelation can be called the throne book. I'll credit that to my professor. Amen. <laughs> can be. Uh, uh, it's, it's always good. I said this last Sunday. It is always good to sit under a very good teacher. Then you become like your teacher. Amen. When you sit under a very good teacher, you become like your teacher. Jesus said this one time. The, 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 the seven can never be greater than his teacher can become just like his teacher. So it's always good to sit under a very good teacher. Uh, Sister Millicent, I'm, this is a recording, but I'm going to mention your name. In VMI, I believe in teaching. I believe that when you've been taught the word of God, I've been to churches growing up since I became born again. I went to some churches that all I hear was, hey, hey, hey. and when I leave, I say, what is, yeah, I, I get the vibe, you know, I get all that. But then I'll leave empty. I don't hear any solid, you know, something that I have in my toolbox. So I believe in teaching. I, I strongly believe that, uh, yeah, all that is part and parcel of, 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 of church activity meaning you clap, you sing, you dance, you jump, you know, you get emotional. That's all good. But I also believe that after all that, I expect the pastor to give me something that I can live there with, something I can have on me when he's not there, when I'm not in the church, I can Amen. call on, you know, something that I can call on when I'm, uh, like I drive, when I'm just by myself, the pastor is not there. So if I go to church and you don't give me that, I'm not satisfied. So here, it is my responsibility to give us that. Today, the throne, again, we're going to talk a little bit about the throne. Throne symbolizes, again, these are all coming from Revelation chapter 4. The throne symbolizes three essential elements. Again, we talk about how the throne, uh, I mentioned that last week, but I'm going to talk about it again today. Sovereignty, government, and judgment. The throne symbolizes these three essential elements, the sovereignty of God, the government of God, and the judgment of God. So when you see God on his throne, he, just like we see over here, when we look at a White House, we look at the executive branch, we see President Biden, the president, is in charge of the government of the Constitution of the United States of America. When we see God sitting on the throne, he is in charge of the universe. Amen. Satan Amen. have no, he has no iota. What he has is delegated power, delegated authority. Amen. And you and I have been given power to Amen. speak to that evil, that demon activity because God is on his throne. So this, uh, this the, 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 the throne again, I said it last Sunday, but it, 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 it is a symbolic of essential element, sovereignty of God, God's government, and God's judgment. The time is coming. You know, I was Last Sunday, you guys remember I was telling you guys that um, what about if Adam repented? We don't know what would have happened. But maybe God in his sovereignty, let's say, let's say the moment Adam saw Eve bite into that fruit, whilst Adam was sitting, he said, honey, you're not supposed to be doing that. And then he stopped it. And Adam did not participate. And he went to God in humility and, and asked forgiveness and repentance. 
We, we don't know what would have happened, but my imagination, I think about scriptures like that. Yeah. Though God says, the day you eat of it, but he never also said the day you eat of it and you've come to repent and ask for forgiveness. He didn't, we don't know what would have happened. You see what I'm saying? That's how I yeah. think about scriptures. So I pick up the Quran. We're talking about the throne of God, which is a symbol of his sovereignty, government, and judgment. As I pick up the Quran, I believe Surah chapter 2, verse 20, I believe verse 27, talk about how virgins, we, we know about this, how virgins are given to this guy. And then Surah, I believe chapter 3 or the same chapter, uh, about 37 somewhere, talking about how Adam repented, God taught Adam repentance. I said, no wonder, I was talking about, yes, that's what Quran says. <laughs> and you and I know that Adam never repented. <laughs> there was no repentance. If Adam had repented, we don't know what would have happened, but it is as a result of Adam's sin that Jesus had to come here, right? So God's throne signifies judgment. There is coming judgment day. So that's what it signifies. Now, the glory of the one sitting, as I already said, describes by the beauty of the two stones. I That is on video. So I'm not going to go into all that. I, I've done a little bit of recap. So I want you to go back and listen to it. That will help you. Uh, now I'm going to go into the the throne, uh, which talk about around this throne are 24 other thrones with elders sitting on them. Who are these elders? Uh, this arrangement seems to be hardened after Sanhedrin. Okay, remember that the Bible has put together. You see, the Bible was given in that it was a progressive revelation. So today, even uh, in the past, the Judeo Christ, uh, Jewish, or uh, I'll say uh, the Judeo belief in God, it is no longer valid. Do you know what I'm talking by that? Until Christ came to the scene, you know, the Jewish believe, still believe in it, yet, uh, one God. But now you got to come through Jesus. So it is no longer valid just to hold on to the laws and the ordinances of God, you know, because mm -hmm. that is no longer valid. So progressively, as God revealed himself in the scriptures, this was all sort of pardon and part and parcel of how the Old Testament was structured. So the elders here was uh, seems to be uh, pardon after the Sanhedrin, which was in... Uh, of the semicircle, the Greek word throne again, thrones here, although some translation, some translations have these as seats. When you read your Bible, some you 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 read it seats, but it's still that same throne. Uh, the Greek translated in a different uh, uh, ways for us. So in verse four, in verse four, uh, elders is a title. The elders there is a title. Uh, it is a title. It is nothing but a title of, of uh, those uh, who are circling around that throne. It is a title. And again, what we are, what I'm doing, what I'm trying to do today, uh, as we look at the synopsis of these chapters, I am not relating it. Word in there to say related to okay, how do we see Africa in here? How do we see America in here? How do we see Europe in here? We are trying to understand uh, from the book itself how some of these things were put together. Uh, how was it put together? Now, are you are you with me though? Are you following me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Amen. So we um we the elders there was just. I'll say it's just a title, and these elders have on white robes, signifying 
purity, purity. The only reason they have on the white robes uh, is to signify purity. They also have on crowns of gold, crowns of gold, crowns of gold. Well, the word translated there, the crowns uh, here is, I believe, I, might, I may have mentioned this earlier. It is the victor's crown. It is, it's, uh, it signifies victory. It signifies triumph. It sig signifies how we, look, Christians, this side of, the, of, of heaven, we are already overcome, even as the Bible says. We are already overcome because we now, Every believer that has, that has passed from death into life, meaning allowing the blood, the justification of the blood to bring about purification, sanctification, which waiting for the glorification of God. We are already overcomers. This is why you and I, every Christian, you have the ability, you have the power, you have what it takes to stand in the face of every adversity in the spirit realm and make a declaration over that situation in the spirit realm. Amen. Because you have that authority. Right. The enemy doesn't want you to think like that, but you, you and I do have that authority because the crown here, which signifies Victor's crown, you and I have that already because we are born again. Right. We've been redeemed. Our conscience has been cleansed. You heard me say this one time last, uh, probably not last week, uh, that those without Christ, they rely on the reason, it is true reason that we communicate. It is true rationality that we disseminate information and all that. But those without Christ rely on those three things, reason, emotion, and conscience. Okay? They, they rely just, just, just on those three things. Uh, just those three things. They, they thought that if only they can reason their way out without allowing in outside authority, which is God. If only they can just be emotional just about it, you know. If only they can just deal with their conscience. And you know that human conscience in itself without God is fault. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Okay? And, mm -hmm. and, and everything that comes with the human emotion without God is and reason, human reason alone, because we know that we are limited. Our incapabilities are full of perversion and distortion. Amen. I, I know mine, you know, I know that my incapabilities without God is full of distortion. <laughs> my own conscience without the cleansing of the whole uh, of the blood of Jesus Christ is 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 is. It's, it's not infallible, but it's fallible, meaning it is limited in scope. It is just limited in my environment. And so over here, you and I, once we've been cleansed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, we can claim this victor's crown. We can talk to that disease that the doctor tells us that this is what you are suffering with. Say, yes, I know this is what the doctor says. But what did the word of God say about my situation? You alone can be in a bedroom and in your in your in, 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 in your bathroom and say, this is, what the, this is what the doctor says, but this is what the word of God says. The word of God says, when I say what proceed out of my mouth to this situation, this is going to be the end result. Yeah, you may not see it immediately, but you have that authority that you can exercise over every situation, over every circumstance. We have that victor's crown. So the, the crown there is a victor's crown. It's a, it's, it's a symbol of, of triumph. Now around the center uh, throne are four living creatures. 
This word, you find this word in Revelation chapter 13, but it's two different words in the Greek. The one translated beast in chapter 13 is different from what we see in chapter four, going down the next, uh, the following verse. When you have time, I want you to uh, read uh, Revelation chapter four on your own. The description of these living creatures match again the Chaldean described in Ezekiel chapter 10. I want you somebody to open, Deacon has opened uh, uh, Ezekiel chapter 10 verse 20, Ezekiel 10, 20. Oh, okay, okay. Ezekiel. Uh, are you guys with me? Uh, mm -hmm. Are you following? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, Ezekiel 10 and 20. Yes. Uh, just, just verse 20? Yes, just verse 20. Okay. okay, this is the living creature I saw under the... This is a living creature I saw under the God of Israel by the river Shabar, and I knew they were cherubim. Amen. So in Revelation chapter 4, verse 6, it said, before the throne, uh, there was a sea of glass. We dis I described that already in the other videos. You can go and watch it. Like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes, from front and back. So the, the, the creatures described here uh, much directly what we find in the book of Ezekiel, meaning also ending here in the Hebrew word makes it plural, the faces of the faces of these, the faces of this living creatures show that they represent God's creation. These living beings carry out God's command in creation. So that's that's what it signifies. That's the meaning of that. The living creatures here shows that uh, or they how they represent God's creation. These living beings carry out God's commands in creation. And so the living creatures we see around, as the Bible describes it, around the throne that these are all significance of God's presence. You present God's creation. Uh, when you go back onto the other um, videos that I have, or other uh, teachings that I made in the same, uh, probably before uh, this particular one, you realize that there was probably a little bit detail out on that. Now that we have covered um, Revelation chapter four, we have now covered Revelation chapter 4. I want you to go back and read for yourself again. What we, what we saw that we have covered uh, the throne of God, the 24 elders, and the living being around the throne. We've covered that. Um, when we're done with the text of the book, then we're going to go into uh, uh, which nations, you see what I'm saying, kind of like uh, modify some of these creatures, where, where do we see them? Like we hear other preachers talk about, uh, where, where do we see them? Can we, can we find a nation represented that today and all other stuff like that? Uh, now that we have covered uh, the creatures and the uh, elders in the book of Revelation chapter four, we are going to proceed on to the seal of the book of Revelation. We start from Revelation chapter five, and the strong angel, uh, the seal of the book, we see that in Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. The strong angel, we see that in Revelation chapter 5, verse 4 to, I mean, 2 to 4. And then the worthy lamb, we see that according to Revelation chapter 5, verse 5 through 14. Now, again, we are still going to talk about the throne of God. God sitting on the throne in the right hand is a scroll or a book sealed with seven seals. Again, I'm gonna encourage anybody that did not listen to us from the very beginning, I have explained why God has seven seals. You guys remember that every numeric in the Bible has a value. You guys remember, right? So yeah. I, want, I want to encourage everybody to go watch that video. 
So seven seals, this symbol means divine. Again, the seven seal means, the symbol here means divine authority and power enact and bring fulfillment of all the plans of God contained in the scroll. It means what? Divine authority and power to enact and bring to fulfillment all the plans of God. So that is the symbol of that seal. And then you know what else I was thinking about the other day? Oh, thank God for God for, for the word of God. The enemy is so deceptive. <laughs> you know, the enemy is so deceptive. Uh, that uh, them, our brother Muslims, I say our brother in the flesh, okay? Uh, our, our brothers Muslims. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was thinking about this seal, when he said uh, they all, when you read the Quran, they, they talk because they, they uh, deceptively perverted the Bible, okay? And so you see that they have all these things they ain't and all that. I'm like, okay, wait a minute. What about the seal, okay, that God has in his hands and we couldn't find anybody, anybody. No one, not in heaven, not on earth, no one to open that seal. I didn't see Muhammad in there. I never saw Muhammad in there. Hallelujah, amen. <laughs> we saw your daughter there too. We never saw Muhammad in there. So here, say the seven seals reflect, again, the seven seals here reflect the fact that in the Roman law, a will had on it, the seven seals of the seven witnesses. Do you know that the Bible, as the Bible was given, um, I don't know whether I have done this historical aspect. God, the 40, as my brother was praying, he even brought that in, the 40 uh, folks that God used to bring out the Bible, God has allowed them to use their vocabulary, to use their environment, so they'll be familiar with what God is saying. So the seal here, the seven seals here also re reflect the fact that in Roman law, the wheel had on it the seven seals of the seven witnesses. So here, the moment, uh, yes, though, because remember that at the time, these guys were living under Roman authority. Right. So God has to make it in a way that they would understand. You see what I'm saying? So when you hear uh, other religious groups, especially I'm going to mention them again, our brother Muslims, we say God is not a man that he cannot make us understand him in a way. No, here God was giving all this revelation, making it sure that the people he was revealing this to at the time can truly relate. So when they saw, they, when they hear the seal, they, their mind will be uh, automatically said, oh, this is a reflective of the Roman law, the wheel on the seventh seal of seven witnesses. So no one in heaven or on earth is worthy to break again the seal and bring into action all that is recorded in the scroll. I want you when you find time to read the book of Revelation. I've given you the hard aspect of it. Read it, Revelation chapter five. Again, chapter five, you find the seal book in verse one. You find the strong angel in chapter five, verse two and four, two to four. And then you find the worthy lamb in chapter five, verse five through 14. Now, a strong angel carries with a loud, or cries with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and lose the seal of it? The strong angel is probably, because we were not given his name, Gabriel, who ordered the closing and sealing of the book in Daniel chapter 12, verse 8 through 9, and Ezekiel chapter 2. Again, the name Gabriel means strength in God. So whenever you, you hear Gabriel, yep, you hear somebody called Gabriel, that's strength in God. Matthew means gift. 
So gift from God, yes, strength from God. Abigail means wisdom. Amen. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because Abigail was a woman of wisdom. When David wanted to destroy after David fled and he was in the wilderness. And uh, at that time, he was, as he was in the wilderness, he was taking, uh, he was protecting any animal, you know, from the wolves and <clears throat> the tigers and everything. And when time came for ship, uh, sharing, Abigail's husband, was one of the owners of those ships. So he said, and Abigail's uh, husband says, <coughs> this <laughs> uh, youth, they just out there doing nothing, wants payment for nothing. It was Abigail who, the wife of the foolish man, who persuaded David. David wanted to kill everybody in that house, including Abigail herself, the husband, and to kill everyone else, it was Abigail who has enough wisdom to, so Abigail means, I'm, I'm just going to the names of, so anyway, Gabriel means strength of God. Why is the scroll so important? Because the scroll contains the plans of God for the Amen. earth and to open it means to bring them into being. Amen. So the scroll, the meaning of that is, again, uh, it is very important because it contains the plans of God for F, and to open it means to bring them into being. Okay, one of the elders told John that the Lion of Judah, the root of David, has overcome and is worthy to open the book and loses the seven seals. Only Christ, amen, the king can open the book and move history in its climatic conclusion. Joe looks and sees not a lion, but a lamb. <laughs> the lamb is alive, but has the marks of sacrifice on it. That's what John sees. Yeah. Saw so the lamb alive, but have marks of sacrifice on it. Amen. So the lamb has finished his redemptive work and is now worthy to open the book. Remember, before this revelation, Christ has already resurrected. Amen. Mm -hmm. So the Lamb has finished his redemptive work and is now worthy to open the book. Now, Muhammad, now Buddha, now Confucius, mm -hmm. now humans, <laughs> now our intelligent. Oh. No, none, none of that. We disqualify none. And again, again, going back, again, remember, remember, the Muslims play with your mind. Muslims play with Christian mind. They always tell you, they mention Isaac, Abraham. They mention everybody you know in the Bible. They say, yeah, we, no, we don't. Remind them always. When they come to you again, you tell them, no, we don't worship the same God. They say, you reject and refuse the cornerstone of Christianity. You know what they are calling Jesus? Is, they're calling Jesus a liar because you and I know very well. Here, the Lamb has finished his redemptive work. That is why he's the only one who, who can open the plans of God. And Islam is calling our Jesus a liar because if Jesus, they are, they, their refutation is that Jesus never went to cross to the cross. And that one of the disciples replaced Jesus. That will make Jesus a liar. That will make Jesus the big liar of F, right? Then, then it does not also qualify Jesus to be the sacrificial lamb because uh, the one that qualifies for that position for redemption has to be blameless. He has to be without. Any blame has to be without any taint and iota of deception. But the Muslims call him a liar because if Jesus replaced one of the disciples, then that means Jesus is lying to the world. Then that means Jesus did not die and he said he died, let alone resurrected. So no, we don't worship the same God. No, we don't. We don't. The Lamb has finished his redemptive work and is now worthy to open the book. All history is in his hands.
Amen. All history which were pierced at Calvary. The Lamb is in the midst of the throne. The four living creatures and the elders symbolizing again uh, that he is the center of all things. Amen. Mm -hmm. Him being in the center, symbolizing that he's the center of all things. This is why the New Testament logos, Jesus, meaning the, the, the encompassing of all things, the creator of all things. He's the center of all things. The lamb has a seven horns, symbolizing complete strength, perfect power in government. He has seven eyes, symbolizing complete all-knowing intelligence, insight, and knowledge. The seven spirits of God symbolize the presence of God everywhere at all times. The Lamb received the book from God signifying that in his hands or in his redemptive work has answered the problems of the redeemed, the destiny of his people in his hands. Amen. 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 <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, any comment, I would like to have that comment recorded. Any comment, anything that stands out to you in this teaching in Revelation chapter 5, any comment. We are just looking at Jesus in this book. Any comment, anything that stands to you, when you say it, it's going to be recorded. It's going to be uh, on record. Yeah, I like how Gabriel, that the meaning of, I, I like I love to know the meaning of names. You Amen. Know. Amen. Gabriel means strength in God. Matthew means Amen. gift. Yeah. That's Amen. wonderful. Amen. Yeah, that's wonderful. Amen. Wow. Uh, I love that. I'd like to hear from uh, Sister Millicent to what was to that to you. I'm sorry. What, what, what was to that to you in the message? Oh, the, the message today. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I read Revelations uh, when I was younger mm -hmm. because of my path, the path that I was on, mm -hmm. and I was afraid that I would not make it into heaven. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, I don't know why I was thinking about it then because I was only like twenty something, but it concerned me. Mm -hmm. I guess because the things that I was doing in the street mm -hmm. was not safe. Mm -hmm. Right. So a relative of mine asked me to read it. Mm. What stood out for me today was how you explain those beasts or um, because I I pictured them being a little more menacing. I see. Then, how you explain? Amen. Um, I'm glad. Amen. Thank, thank God. Um, Rev, okay, Rev is not here. Uh, again, everything you guys said is is on record. Okay, I'm I'm still recording, but I like that contribution. Uh, before I pause the recording, um, I, I'm gonna post this on YouTube again. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, wait a minute. Let me cut to the back. Uh, uh, Deaconess, uh, you mute yourself. Unmute yourself. You mute it. <laughs> All right. You were saying something. Go ahead. I was, I was thinking about what she said because back around, I was around that same age group and I was intrigued about revelation okay. but you know but i didn't i didn't you know i don't i was at that point you know in god oh you know how some people just intrigued about revelation you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but i think about the 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 uh the, the beast of the, the mm -hmm. four and you know you think about symbolism mm -hmm. so it's like wow is, are, are we are you gonna see actually you know, all the eyes and, and, and this, it's like, wow. But that's why I just love teaching. It's just so important, you yeah. know, and it really breaks it down, you know, because some things are literal and some things are symbolic. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. So, Amen. wow, that's something. God's creation. Wow, Amen. that's what, that's what they symbolize. Amen. Amen. And I Amen. hope, Pastor, hopefully yes. later you're break it down even more as far as each each one, the eyes, the you know what you know what they mean. Amen. Amen. Now I um probably go back. Um, I have it here. Uh, probably that escaped you a little bit. Um, I talk about the seven spirits of God. I talk about the 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 lamb has horns symbolizing complete strength and perfect strength, perfect power in government. And you also have seven eyes symbolizing complete all knowing intelligence, insight, and knowledge. I believe that's what you were referring to. So yeah, you might want to go back and and, and that's what you were referring to, right? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. So it's it's right there. So it, it symbolizes complete all knowing intelligence, insight, and knowledge. You hear in theology, when you hear about omniscience. So this is the description, a, a correct description of that uh, omniscient, all-knowing God, but it's yes. just in, in, in intelligent insight and knowledge. Anyway, uh, Rev, you want to add something? You want to give, give a... Everything is recorded. It's part of the recording, okay? <laughs> I don't have much to say, but, you know, to, to piggyback off of what you said, that that shows, you know, the, all the attributes of God, our Father. Amen. You know, he sits on the throne. He knows everything. He's everywhere at the same time. And he Amen. definitely have all power in his hand. Amen. Amen. You know? um, I do want to say something, though. Um, mm -hmm. Something you mentioned earlier about us knowing, uh, us being overcomers, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in, in Christ. You know, you know, one of the issues with the church and the, uh, the body of Christ, I should say rather, um, is that, and I like how you brought that out about we're already overcomers. The problem is, is that we don't know who we are in Christ. You know? And the reason why we're like that is because we're ignorant to his word because we don't study like we should. We don't go to Bible class. We don't go to church. We don't go to Sunday school. We don't do none of that. So, and then when you're at home in your own time, you still don't pick up the Bible and read. It's sitting on the table collecting dust. And then all along, you need to be knowing who you are in Christ so you can declare and decree a thing. How are you going to declare and decree anything when you don't know what you can declare and decree? Amen. Uh, I... Uh, that that contribution also um, after we do the book of Revelation, bro, we're gonna go back into the book of Ephesians and I lay a lot of emphasis on who you are in Christ, and why yeah, you are in wonderful. Christ. Yeah, and um, it, it, it's it's it, this is even this season uh, you find real Christians. Look, where are we? We are in our homes, but a comfort our homes. You don't need a lift to a dead <laughs> church if you don't have a car. <laughs> Right. Nowadays, you don't need a lift. You don't need a taxi. All you need is, Lord, I thank you for waking me up this morning. Okay? Right. Yeah. Uh, if, if you can choose not to take a shower or do whatever. You, you, can, mm -hmm. you can worship God once you are invited. You know, where are we? Uh, we are on various homes. So there is no excuse for mm -hmm. not knowing who you are. And also, it, it helps. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say that they make excuses as to why they can't do this or they can't do that. You know, um, like you say, Pastor, you have it right here in your own house. You don't have to get up. You don't have to travel to go nowhere but to your office, to your bedroom, or you're at the dining room table. However, we even fail to do that. You know, um, it's like the desire to want to know Christ is not there. And all they care about is the things of this world or how I'm, where my next meal or how I'm going to pay my bills and all of that. When, you know, Christ is sitting there saying, what about me? You know, <laughs> I'm the one who helped you get everything you got. Amen. It was, it was, again, I say, when, when I came to this ministry, I didn't have two pennies to rub together. I didn't have no car. You know, uh, you made me catch the bus. <laughs> I remember that, but the point that I'm trying to make is, is that when you line your life up with God, 
when, uh, or Christ, everything else will fall in line. But without him, you're nothing, you know? And it goes back to when we was talking about tithing and everything too. And, and you brought up Haggai chapter two, verse two, where it talks about when you don't give, you have holes in your pocket. It's like you put your money there, but it goes, you, have, you ever, have you ever had a hole in your pocket when you was a kid and your little quarters fell out down through your leg and then went on the ground? And then you went searching for your money and you realize when you pull your pocket out, there's a hole this big in it. And now your money gone and you don't know where it's went. Well, that's exactly what happened when you don't give uh, uh, to, 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 the, to Christ, you know. Um, people look at the preacher. Don't look at the preacher. Look at who you are representing. Look at who you're giving to. Because I guarantee you, if you don't give it to God, he'll get it. He'll get it. Ask Dickens. She'll tell you. <laughs> Amen. Well, I, 